Hey, it's Jillian Barbary. Another episode of Ask Jillian. And with me always is Lizzie. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Happy to have you, but really happy. Not that I'm, you know, not loving you, Liz, but really happy to have our guest today. Our special guest, Deborah Tate, who's been friends with me for over two decades. Hi, Deb. Hi, Jillian. It's so funny to see you and talk to you like this because we've known each other. Ooh. I'm going to say Ariana, your daughter. I don't know how old, I remember she was 17. The first time we spoke, we, in, I'll back it up. We met because I at 11 years old, read Helter Skelter. And I wrote Vincent Bugliosi a letter and said, thank you for keeping these monsters behind bars. Fast forward. And he was the lawyer on the case, correct? He was okay. the head lawyer. Uh, he and um, Stephen K. That is correct. Stephen K. Who ended up doing so many things at the end and going to all the parole hearings um, with the families, including Deb. So long story short, I come to Hollywood and I get a computer and I'm typing in, uh, because I think they were lobbying for maybe one of my co-hosts to get a star on the Walk of Fame. Maybe it wasn't that early, but I was like, Sharon Tate needs a star on the Walk of Fame because she's amazing and what happened to her is horrific and her life was cut short. So I started looking into it. I saw that there was no star on the Walk of Fame. And I saw that you petition and that the Hollywood Council, it's Johnny Grant at the time, and they go through the list of names and they decide, you know, who gets a star. And it cost 15000 I think it was that at the time. So I contacted a person who ran a website and through that Deb and I met and um, I said, we should get your sister a star on the Walk of Fame. And I remember you were, first of all, I called the house, it's the funniest, and her daughter answers. And, you know, she's 16, which is what I have to look forward to. By the way, (laughs) very soon. (laughs) Oh, my God. Ari's here today. And she's like, oh, my God, I love her. When I first called, she's like, hello. And I said, oh, hi, mate. Speak with Deborah Tate, please. She goes, who's this? And I'm like, oh, it's... um, Gatekeeper. Yeah, yes, yes. And I'm like, oh, because, like, think of all the crazy people over the years. So I say it's me. And I hear the phone, you know, it's like falling. And then Deb gets on the phone. And that was our initial conversation. Yes, it was. And you're like, don't, I remember you saying to me, don't mind her. She's a 16 or 17 year old teenager. And I started laughing. And now do those words ring in my head? (laughs) Very true. (laughs) They are true today as they were a hundred years ago, <laughs> 200 years ago, you have a teenage daughter, it's going to be the same story. Well, let's go back to being a teenager because when everything happened to Sharon, you were, and if those of you don't know, the Manson murders, uh, Charles Manson's family went in and murdered Sharon and all of her friends on a horrible night in August of 1969. You at the time were 16? I was 16 at oh. that time. And then your younger sister, Patty, was 11. 11. She was Ruby's age. So, so Sharon was... 26. Your big sister to yes. both you and your sister. Oh, yes. yeah. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And she was an amazing woman, right? More of a big sister to me simply because of the age difference. When Sharon left my family home at 18, actually, she left a little bit early. She emancipated and left early. But when she left home, Patty was only three years old. So there was not the that connection. The connection and then died when Patty was 11 years old. And of course, Sharon had an amazing career mm-hmm. in between. So there wasn't as much interaction with the younger sister Whereas Simply you were a because of the logistics, I was a friend that was integrated into her social circle. I went to the private clubs with them, dinners with them. Her friends were my friends you then knew Roman and well. now. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and still, still to this day. And so, when Sharon's life was sort of opening up and evolving into the emancipation, because she was doing beauty pageants from a very Correct. young age and she was starting to take acting lessons is that when she moved here because she was born in Verona no she Italy? she was in Verona she was a uh, she uh graduated high school who was born in, in texas everybody but patty was born in texas mother would run across borders state borders just to drop us in texas sharon was born in <laughs> wow. dallas in dallas yeah. because uh deb's father was military military right so he was an interesting man colonel paul tate in and of himself he would travel also wasn't a big fan of seeing his daughter so beautifully put on different posters and ads is that true or is he was he protective or was he did he understand her beauty that was a double-edged sword because uh I can certainly see it in pictures he was not a fan of people lurking at 
Yeah. Any of the three of, of us. You know, he was a very good looking man and had his young manhood still in mind. He knew what they were thinking. Yeah. As a father of three beautiful daughters, that's got to be a rough road. A- so, a- so he was very protective, but yet at the same time, he allowed her to model astride a a missile, mm-hmm. a, a Nike missile in Daisy Duke shorts and a tied up shirt. And she was 15 years old oh, at the time. Wow. Mm-hmm. That famous shot was being taken while Very my famous. little sister was being born. So mom was in the hospital having and I wanna... Patty because she may not have gone for that shot. But during different photo shoots, dad allowed the U.S. military to use Sharon as their private poster person. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to go back to, because I don't think I knew this. So you're the middle sister. Yes. You've lost both your older sister and your baby sister? Correct. Oh, wow. So Wow, Deborah. Yes. That is... Patty ended up passing. Tell us about Patty at 42 of breast cancer. Of breast cancer. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer a little over a year and a half ago, year and a half and change. And... Um, uh, and Jennifer, uh, the, pl- the Valley of the Dolls, the character that that Sharon is played by playing. Sharon, yeah. has dies of breast, breast cancer. cancer. She and actually takes her life because, because of she, having breast, breast cancer. cancer. Her character's mother, mother made her feel as if the on only her. way that she, or reason she was worth, yeah, all of her self worth was tied up with her boobs it and her, her her looks. Yeah. So she took her life because she was diagnosed with breast cancer. We're talking the character here. Right. Just the to character. Yes, yeah. yes. Sharon so didn't have any in of real the life, my little sister was diagnosed. And on At her, what age, Deb? 40. That's young. It is. And her tumor was already, I was told, almost two inches square, bigger th- as a golf ball under oh. the arm. And she chose, for whatever reason, to stick her head in the sand and not go get a mammogram her doctor she said was very matter of fact about it and said oh i think you should go get a mammogram instead of you need to go get a mammogram now you know and And patty left it off i remember when you sent me her medical reports and she said something's off i remember you saying this it looks like it could be and she's such a self doctor self healer self everything okay she does not fuck around so she said I feel that this could be stage one. Long story short, a lot of time went by and we ended up going to Bedford Breast. Uh, We wanted the best. We researched it and we found um, Dr. Leslie Memzik in Beverly Hills. Deb goes, we're sitting and we meet Dr. Memzik. Right away, I liked her. Did you like her right away? I did. I really liked her. This is for your breast cancer. For my breast cancer. cancer. Now, I had already been diagnosed, but I only had... Uh, Medi-Cal, because I don't, I don't, contrary to public belief, people think I'm very wealthy and I get paid for all of the television I do. I do not. I never made a dime. She doesn't get paid to go and keep the killers behind bars. No, I don't get paid for that. And I, I also counsel probably hundreds of thousands of victims across this country. You know, whenever they need somebody on the other end of a phone and they're going nuts, I take phone calls all day, all night. So she's an advocate. And never take anything for it, nor would I if anybody offered. This is, it's a, it's by the grace of God that I've come through, and I don't believe that I should hold people hostage when they need help and the help financially. I just jump in and I help. So I'm not a wealthy woman. I had. Medi-Cal, and of course, their services are really, really bad. They'd rather kill you Horrible. than heal you. Yeah. So between my knowledge and their knowledge, and I got a great gal on the mammogram. She gave me a free sonogram, and she found it when it was just three centimeters. Yes. Yeah. But enough And then to... I couldn't get... I, they wanted to give me a varicose vein doctor to remove the cancer. And I that? knew that that would kill me. Can that would be... Die, that? Sign my death certificate right now. I said that no. That makes no sense going, whatsoever. No. I wanted no. the Bedford Breast Cancer Center. I lusted after it and said, oh, I, I called. And they didn't take any kind of insurance. And I went, oh, okay, dismiss that. Step in, Jillian. Well, she they, made it happen. They got it done. And I remember I didn't know a freaking thing about breast cancer. Fast forward, I get diagnosed whenever a year and a half later, but I knew exactly where to go. But same scenario. So she knew. And what I loved about Bedford is that they did this surgery on her for breast cancer. And they also, I think preemptively, 
took out some of your lymph nodes. They did. They took out two. She said, I didn't like the look of them, so I went ahead and did it. It wasn't something they had discussed before, if I'm not mistaken. We did not discuss it at all before. Uh, there is a dye that they inject That's right. into the tumor while the tumor is still in your body and living, and then any tract, any cancer cells along the vein path uh, light up, sort light of light up to cobalt blue, and usually your lymph nodes would light up too. Well, my lymph nodes did not light up, but she had an intuition. She said, "Just for shits and giggles, I took out two. This is after I woke up. I took out two. I said, fine with me. As far as I'm concerned, you can have everything. I, I would have preferred to mm -hmm. have gotten a total mastectomy. Yeah, over which it. is like a double to mastectomy be to be safe. Yeah. Rather, I I was always mad at my little sister for opting for a lumpectomy." When I knew, because I'm the great investigator, that she was not a candidate for a lumpectomy and she was in remission for a year, the next following year, it she came didn't back follow and up. it took her. It took her. At yeah. 42, you said. At 42. Yeah. So young. Did she have With children? With three young children. Oh, no. Oh, so God. then that brings us to, to Doris Tate, who is Deb's mom, who to me is the original amazing advocate for everything because I'm sitting here at 53 thinking, how old was your mom when Sharon was taken? Let me see, I believe she was 44. 44 years old. My mother had Sharon when she was 18. And so when you take us back to that day, I know that your last night with Sharon was watching the moon landing at her home. Correct. In Benedict Canyon, where everything happened. Uh, you went up there, your dad, your mom, and Patty? Yeah. Everybody. So the, yeah, whole, the whole family, family. watched mm -hmm. it in her room on her bed. Right, because that's where the TV was. Back in the days when the household only had one TV. It was mm -hmm. in Sharon's bedroom. That is correct. How come she didn't have it in the living room? I'm just I curious. I think at one point in time it was in the living room, but in her extremely pregnant state, she, she was moved spending it. a lot of time yeah. in the bed, for in, sure. Actually, in between the bed and the pool, because the so swimming hot. pool, it was not only hot, but that's where she could achieve weightlessness and takes the weight off the back and yeah. basically. It feels so it much feels good. So, yeah, better to float. Much better to float. So you guys watched it and then said goodbye like a regular goodbye. Right. And uh, Roman was still filming in London. That is he? correct. He was due to come back at any time. You know, he was, was editing. Correct. He, he was not editing. He uh, was actually writing. He was doing the Day of the Dolphin, yeah. which Sharon was going to play the lead in. I think he tentatively had made arrangements with Jack Nicholson, so it was going to be Jack and Sharon. And he was in pre-production. Pre-production, oh. exactly. Okay. People don't realize what a swinging 60s character Sharon was in the London scene, and I remember YouTubing. Uh, it was her and David... Um, David Hemmings. David Hemmings. Yes. The big night out, and yes. it was like, welcome. We, we want to introduce you to this incredible up-and-coming actress, Sharon Tate. Was and it so, like a lifestyle talk show? Uh, it wasn't even a talk show. It was, this is how cool and advanced it was. They just sort of followed her through the streets of London, looking at different shops, vintage boutiques, to the Playboy Club in London, which was hip and happening. Um, isn't that where she got married? It is. Yeah. Well, that's not where she got married. She, she got married reception. in the... Um, the courthouse? The courthouse, yeah. yeah. And then had the reception. And then had the reception at the Playboy Club. And everybody yeah. oh, was wow. there. Everybody was there. It was, was an A-lister. It was an A-lister. I mean, I, you, if you look at pictures, I see everybody. And I'm Diana just like, Ross. I, everybody. Joan Collins, Joan David Collins, Nivens. Yeah. It was just everybody. Everybody. Were you too young to be there or were you there? I was not there. None of the family was there. Yeah. We were in school. <laughs> well, you were yeah. the, at we that were age, in yes. School. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with them, even if the family lived somewhere else. I spent a lot of time with Sharon. As a matter of fact, I lived at her house that whole summer while she was gone because people think they know what they know, but they don't know. <laughs> That's another uh, thing. Abigail, I... Abigail was there to finish a task that Sharon had started with me, but was unable to complete because she had accepted. A movie deal, right? Which what, what was the task with Abigail? To find me a private school where I could have my horse. So Sharon and I believe Roman gifted you this horse. Yes, Sharon gifted me the Sharon horse. Did. Yeah. 
And that was the horse's name? Shalazar. Shalazar. I had raised, she uh, gifted me the horse when the horse was six months old. And the horse then, when when Roman came on scene, and that was a trip where Sharon was introducing Roman to the family for the first time. Poor guy. Oh my God. Poor guy. (laughs) He's got to meet military dad. And he still married her. So that's exactly. I met Roman first. We lived in Sausalito uh, at one of the few bases I've ever lived on, but it was the coolest base. It's called Fort Baker. And Is it it's, on the beach? It's on the beach. It's got its own private cove, old Victorian houses, wow. maybe eight of them. And It didn't uh, feel like a base at not all. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Wow. But in any case, she had me leave the cool base behind and meet them in Sausalito at the Sausalito Hotel. And... She was trying to verbally prepare him for, and I guess he wasn't quite buying it. So I came in as support and said, no, this is exactly what you're going to see. Puff, puff, turn. That's the cigar going. Puff, puff, and then he takes it. Your dad. And turns it a quarter of a turn and does not say a word. Oh, my God. And with this cold... (laughs) staring green eyed glaze makes you want to vacate the premises (laughs) (laughs) or walk to the other side of the street he he had a very foreboding well i know during the trial there were very big concerns that he was going to bring a gun right that he was going to do something he's a colonel in the army these people had just slaughtered his daughter i'd be concerned too that's a whole other interesting story we'll get to but now you're back home and you guys are living in palace verdes we moved back from the cool house in sausalito to our family home, which we'd rented out while we did our three years in Sausalito, and we were coming back home. Dad was still active hierarchy at the Presidio. In uh, San Francisco. In San Francisco, because there are three bases, the Presidio, Fort Baker, and Fort Mm Berry. All of Fort Baker and Berry, the mountains open up. That's why it was all this open acreage, and missiles come out. To Jeez, defend crazy. Northern California. Can't believe oh, it. Imagine that. I'm going to back up for a second. When I wanted my horse, I'm a big animal person and traveling, it was always very difficult. My dad thought it would be the end of everything if you he said, you've got, to, you've got to go ask the general. And then the, the neighboring 600,000 acres belong to the Indian nation. So he says, you've got to go ask the general. Mm. for permission and then you've got to go ask the indian chief well i did and they said yes <laughs> <laughs> very determined so, oh so she's sharon, very determined sharon got me shalazar for i think she was 500 bucks and i spent two years training her and there's wonderful pictures of roman we put roman up there bareback <laughs> <laughs> and he was going something. off sideways when she started trotting and he said <laughs> oh i think she's losing me <laughs> he falls off sideways we were all laughing hold, trying to hold it back but I picture your dad and Roman. I know that your dad had a good relationship with Jay Sebring already. Didn't Jay have a connection up in San Francisco? Yeah, some sort? he came up there to start a Sebring's International, International. in San hair, Francisco. Hair salon. Very successful. And yeah. so mm-hmm. we got him a houseboat in Gate 6 in Sausalito. Okay. And Jay was like my big brother. Brother, yeah. You know? And he was always in love with Sharon. It's There's no doubt about that. It's a Tate thing. We don't like discarding people. People. They're very, very valuable because when you are uprooted from your life every three years, when you have a connection with somebody, you don't want to lose you it. You don't want to lose it. So their relationship had gone totally platonic. People would like to fantasize that there was more yeah. there. Jay realized that he screwed up when she actually left him. But there's no going back. Once yeah. we're gone, we're gone. But they were still very, very good, good friends, friends. Which very is good friends. speaks volumes of their right. two personalities. Right. Um, I think he was waiting around, hoping for mm-hmm. Roman to make a mistake. In which case, had it happened organically, he would have gone back in for round two. Which but, brings me to, and we were going to get to the whole Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and your involvement in that, the portrayal of his character by Emil Hirsch, I thought was really interesting. 
interesting. I thought the Steve McQueen character was interesting, um, and and uh, certainly Margot Robbie as as Sharon. But we're jumping ahead. You had mentioned. Abigail Folger. People don't realize Abigail Folger was heir to the Folger's Mountain Grown Coffee, Coffee. who was there that mm-hmm. night. Uh, she was due to go back to San Francisco, I believe, the next day to visit her mother. To visit her mom. Exactly. Inez. And then Wojtek Vykowski, who was her, her boyfriend. Her boyfriend. And then Stephen Parent, who sadly... Was related to nobody and knew nobody, <sighs> just except the caretaker next door. William Gerritsen. Wrong who was place, wrong, wrong time. time. Uh, William Gerritsen was the caretaker whom he had exchanged numbers to get a stereo. So he showed up. He was only 18, and he was the first to go. These um, killers, I want to add, at the time, it was Tex Watson. It was uh, Linda Kasabian who drove the car. It was Patricia Krenwinkel, and it was Susan Adkins. Deb, you have been to every single parole hearing. When we talk about the death penalty, and I'm a big advocate for it, um, It got overturned in California in 71, so they didn't have to go to die. And when people say to me they're against the death penalty, I always say, well, you know, the person who died, their loved ones now spend their life going to hearings. That's if there's one murderer. In this case, there were many. So you've spent, as your mother did, a lifetime going to parole Nobody, Nobody has spent more time than I have. And the reason... I just want to clarify that, uh, is when Marcy's law was passed, the rules on who could and could not speak at parole hearings changed a little bit. Before, mother could only go to the hearings of the Manson family members that were actively involved with taking Sharon's So life. that would be Tex and Susan, Tex and, and, Susan Patricia. and Patricia. Now, your mother was not able to speak. I want to go back, actually. Yeah. Let's backtrack. Now you are a teenager. She's your sister. She's a huge movie star, married to a major movie director living in Beverly Hills. And then you're down in your home in Palos Verdes. That's right. Rancho Palos Verdes. Is yeah. It? Okay. So now what day is it? How do you get the news? And what happens next? Ugh. Well, it's August 9th. Mm-hmm. And um, it was unbelievably hot. We were in the middle of a heat wave. We were unpacking the boxes, preparing the home, and my little sister's watching cartoons, and mom and I are working our booties off, trying to get the house ready, um, because we know we have a baby coming. Mm-hmm. You know, this yeah. is all, we've got to get settled, and we've got to get settled now. Because you're going to be there for Sharon We're and gonna go help her. We're going to be there for Sharon. Mm-hmm. Sharon had She's a room that two was being, weeks. yeah, being prepared for mom. It's, you know, it, I went through it much, much later, uh, I mean, after the these events, but every woman I know that has children, it's a very scary process. Even when you want it and you're praying for it, you want your mommy, mm-hmm. you know, and Sharon was no different. So yeah. on the other side of the house, there was a little room with a single bed being prepared, and that was for my mother. And my mother did the same thing for me. She did the same thing for my little sister, you know, t- taught us the first ropes of motherhood. So she would, the plan was that she was going to move in yeah, and be there had, as a grandmother. Yeah, we had to, yeah. the, that was a, a vast possibility. We have young Roman and Sharon, and Roman's working and Traveling. Sharon's going to be working and, you know, people not knowing exactly what they're doing. New mothers never know what they're doing. Um, grandma, grandma. It was the logical choice. So we had marching orders to get the Palos Verdes house ready. Patty and I would be going back to school. So this all had to happen pretty quick. And to move an entire family home and get it settled, ready for two big ones to go to school, mom to leave to go help the oldest with a newborn baby. It was it was serious. A lot. So I mean, I was working myself silly. There was a knock at the door. Thankfully, there was a knock at the door and there was a little neighbor lady with a coffee cake in her hand. And mom said, come in, I'll put on a pot of coffee. And I took that opportunity to go jump in the shower because I was hot. I was sweaty. I was working hard. It was one of the hottest summers. Yeah. And the day before we had talked about it, everyone say, oh, I was invited to Sharon's house. Yeah, Nobody no was invited. Party. There was no party. There was never a party. Just, okay. Never no. a party. Never any El Coyote. Oh, who has on swimsuit uh, bottoms 
gets up, gets dressed, comes home after a restaurant and puts on the same clothes that she was lounging around in all day long. That just doesn't happen. If you're a pregnant lady, you come in and you put on a pair of comfy, comfy, yeah. you know, some comfy little short t-shirt thing and maybe some granny panties and she over had your big belly the and day, call it a day. The day of, she did have, it was Joanna Pettit over. They had a little light lunch in the yes. backyard and yeah. floated in the yes. pool. And not Joanna Pettit and oh. friend. The no, friend was Joanna. going to come. The friend wasn't, was just a barely acquaintance of Sharon, had met a couple times. But Joanna came with her they son. They were very good friends. And she had a 350 SL convertible Mercedes and a car seat for her child. There was no room for the other lady. So she mm. was supposed to follow in her own car and, she and never, never did. And that night there was no party planned. And no. so now the next day you're going on with your life. You get in the shower. It's now, what, Saturday morning, I would imagine? I don't even know what day of the week. And then the lady across the street comes in with a coffee cake. Your mom puts on coffee, and then? I go jump in the shower. I've got long red hair almost to my knees. I've got soap all over my hair, and all of a sudden, the shower stall door slides back. And I'm staring at my mother sobbing, and she says, Sharon's dead. And then she, and I'm, I'm frightened to get the damn door out of her hand because this other little lady who, standing there. who weighs about 82 pounds soaking wet is, is supporting my mother. Oh, and I'm looking at this woman staring at me naked and soap dripping down my face. I'm trying to get the door closed. But when she said Sharon's dead and I, it didn't click and I'm still fighting How for the door. It? And then she collapsed down to the floor and I went, holy shit, what's going on? So she got up and the little lady led her partially crawling out of the bathroom oh and God. back to the kitchen. I didn't even rinse off I or dry off. I wrapped one towel around my head, another around my body, wet footed and flop, flop, flop. Not down understanding the hall. what Not, in the hell And then I got in on. the kitchen and I... Tell me again, because she's sobbing and can hardly speak. Tell me again my God. what happened. And what, with great pain, she informed me that my boyfriend, or ex-boyfriend, we were friends also at that time, Wayne had called and said that he was sorry to hear about Sharon. Oh, my God. She didn't know anything. He was listening to the radio. Didn't they think it was a fire or something? There were some strange reports yes. coming out. It came out. He had heard that it was a fire in Benedict Canyon. Five people were dead. And it was unconfirmed, but at the house of Sharon Tate Polanski. Mm. That's how you uh, heard can, through. So, yeah. But mother didn't tell me all this. Uh, mother just said, Wayne told her. So I get on the phone. With Wayne. With Wayne. And... My father, backing up a little bit, was intelligence and counterintelligence. I am my father's daughter. So I'm you the sure voice are. of reason, and I'm tracking You're also an investigative, events, like, you could have been an investigative mind. reporter. You could have been a cop, FBI. That's could have been that's, a doctor. That's just the way your, your, your mind works. Yeah. It's always been like that, yeah. So, um, so I got Wayne on the phone, and I said, what radio station? He says, I don't know, probably KHJ. I said, Go out to the car and turn the radio on and call me back. It was KHJ. And so then I hang up. I practically hung up on him. I don't even think I said goodbye. And I called KHJ. Oh news my desk. God. And I said, did you run a story? And they said, yes, we did. I said, what was the source of that story? They said, they just heard it over the... Newswire? The, like not the a news scanners. Wire, like Back a then scanners. they had a police oh, scanner. Exactly. And so it was very scattered information at this point. I don't think it was confirmed until William Tennant, perhaps. Right. William Tennant went up. Is when That's how it got confirmed. William Tennant was a... Was Re Sharon Sharon's a, uh, Romans, actually. Manager? manager or, yeah. An agent. He was playing tennis at a private home. Okay. Mother had been calling... Sandy was his oh, wife. Knowing that he was close in they proximity. They were close by. Close proximity. Right, and right. Sandy said, he's on the court. We can't get him. You mm. have to wait. Mom obsessively calling back and forth. So in between phone calls, I'm having to run to the lady next door's house to use her phone to do my investigation. Because your mom's on her phone trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Just obsessively. Of course. Oh, you know, if you call somebody and they say, he's not here, he's on the tennis court. 
you know, I can't get a hold of him and is not forthright with any information, you don't hang up, pick up the yeah. phone and call the same person back again. And yeah. Go to a, you know, plan B. Yeah. So anyway, I'm running back and forth, trying to keep mom together, trying to find out what's going on. I call the police. No, I called the fire department. I'm sorry, fire department. They because said, you no, thought it was a fire. Yeah, we thought it was a fire. That's what they had reported over those scanners. And the fire department says, no fire at that address. I said, well, the location in Benedict Canyon, half of it's served by Beverly Hills, and the other half is served by the Valley. So I called the Valley Fire Department. Did you service a fire? No, nope, we didn't serve a fire. Called the cops. Cops went silent. Oh. And they said, well, we'll have somebody call you back. And the guy you, called me back. Did you identify who you were? Yes, I did. Okay. Oh, God. They asked me where my mom and dad, they asked me how old I was first. Okay. They asked me if my mom or dad was available. I said, dad's not here and mother is incapacitated. You have to talk to me. They never would confirm what had happened, but hours went by and nothing was happening. That'd be torture. And they started to ask me or make plans if I would come up because mom couldn't do it. Dad was nowhere. Where was your father? Well, I actually, in one of the in-between phone calls, I had to call the Presidio. He was on the parade field marching a bunch of guys. He was in San Francisco. In San Francisco, you know, where they were full-colored brigades marching. of men marching around, and I told his aide that I had to talk to my father now. The urgency must have sparred that man because he ran, as stories told, ran across the parade field, got dad and said, you're needed at home on the phone. This is urgent, blah, blah, blah. Dad came in and he's, dad told me and everybody else, oh, I was sure that something happened to Debbie. Oh. Because I was the tomboy and an athlete and a equestrian and the a sort gymnast. The, and, the, the risk taker yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, she's, you know, jumped off the roof again. That's when I was a small child. Mm -hmm. Bigger teenage boys would convince me that I could fly. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, said, oh, with, yeah? the with the towel around my neck. <laughs> yeah, I, I fly you. all right. That is you. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I got little scrapes and bruises and broke bones and things. No, often he assumed enough. it would be he he, he, the last person me, he thought would be her. Would be her. He came back into his office and called me at the house. And I had to tell him, Dad, Sharon's dead. <sighs> and I heard the <sighs> phone hit the ground. And in the meantime, the LAPD is sending a car to come and get me. And I am dreading down to the core to identify of her my sister. body. But do you still think at this point it's a fire? No, we knew that something had happened. Okay. They said okay. something had happened, but they weren't at liberty to okay. say. But they did say that they she was gone? Wanted, yeah, they didn't say who they did not say the particulars they weren't saying anything but you must but they have were going to yes from yeah. there from them wanting to send somebody to come and get me to take me to the scene which now if i had walked in on oh. that scene as a matter of fact william tennant did walk in on the scene oh, why did he walk in on the scene because he heard the same radio piece in the loop, when they would loop the news on the radio, that Wayne had heard when he got off the tennis court and he just dropped in on the scene. Nobody at the gate, nobody at nothing. He walked in. He walked in. He and walked in cold. Oh. Now, it troubled it him for him. life. And he it, came, if I'm not mistaken, devastating. he threw up. I think oh. he came out and was not, yeah. he, he was threw sick. threw up. He, his yeah. life went in the toilet. He went homeless. Um, Jeez. He, then he went to Europe and tried to do a few things. And, and this is a man who work. was a manager who did very well, who oh, was successful, well. represented major names. He, and it, he had PTSD, basically. Oh, it ruined. And it, ruined his life. Completely it, it, ruined it, it, not, his life. Not, not only just him, uh, I remember taking you to do a documentary, and there was a police officer. Yes. And he is still to this day. This was just a few years ago. And uh, to this day. And this is what the man did for a living. He's he was he's haunted. So I, I I'm so thankful that you didn't. Yeah, I am too. And Bill Tennant. I mean, it took him probably twenty years. He was on the street homeless for twenty years, drug addicted, 
alcohol addicted Jeez. all because of what he had walked in on. Now, that being my beloved sister, oh, if no. I had to go and do that job, no. But they were taking you to do that. So They what? were taking me so to were. do that because there was no choice. But in Bill the meantime, Ten Bill Tennant, Bill got, Tennant there. got there. So he was able to identify And the them. cop car that had me in it, they radioed it and flipped it around and took me back home because they didn't need my help. But was there part of you, because it's your sister and it sounds like your personality, were you desperate to get to her in some way for answers, just to see, just to have... You know, that's a very, that's a very interesting question. I've never gone back and visited that. <clears throat> hmm. No, no is the answer to that because by then I'm a very spiritual person. Sharon and I were very connected. There was a chaotic thing happening in the air and I could still channel in on energy and I knew she was gone. You did. I knew she was gone, at, but yet there's all this chaotic energy going on. And I didn't hear a voice saying, don't go. Um, but I did have a very strong presence that I was not supposed to go. You know, I just knew I was not supposed now, to go. Now, when you guys were... Did you watch any news? Because there were helicopters. Horrible. That's all it was. Was it was horrible? I sent, news crews. I sent Patty to the lady next door's home. Dorothy was she my was mother's only 11? best friend. She was eleven. Oh, yeah. While all this was happening, I didn't want her to see her mother falling apart to that degree. I didn't want her to see me. I didn't want her to be in front of that freaking TV set with yeah. these news breaking stories things. That's and all it was. It was just horrible. So I tried my very best to keep my younger sister, who was the youngest daughter, and and kind of sheltered, you know? Yeah, you hope it. And 11. 11. And it doesn't matter if they were had the physical time together that Sharon and I did. That's her big sister. Yep. And this is an inconceivable mm -hmm. act. And I just didn't want her to have to see that. No. You know, eventually she did see it. But mm -hmm. in that moment, in that first 24 hours, I was hell bent to keep her from seeing that and to keep her from feeling the chaos the, oh, of I my mother completely falling apart. Your mother who ended up being one of the most strong voices. She's the reason families are able to speak at hearings now. They were never able that to was, speak. Was it called the Marcy Law? No, Marcy, Marcy Law came after, after the fact. Okay. The lady that wrote Marcy's Law actually attended the meetings for parents of murdered children in our home for many, many years. Marcy was her daughter who was also murdered. So... Um, the she author. and your mom became became close. friends yeah now friends. so when these animals get convicted and they go away for quote life they're supposed to get death okay fine now they that, get life that was called the victim's bill of rights that's that your mother yeah, got passed that mother got passed yeah. and uh you know one of the victim's bill of rights addressed the issue of the next of kin being able to come and speak at the parole hearings, giving what is called a victim's impact statement. So that's... Which of you've done many. I've done you, many, 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 many. Yes. And so uh, I want to talk about a period of time where your mom thought, okay, those horrible people are away for life. And then I'm going to try to, you know, pick up the pieces. And I think it was 10 years that That's went right. by. That's right, 10 years. And Only what 10 happened? Years. Only 10. What 10 happened years. after that? Steve K., the deputy DA, who... We love. We love. Yeah. We absolutely adore. Yeah. It, to me, he is... A god. Godsend. Yeah. Well, Because Vincent know, went nuts at the end. I'll just say it, and yeah, I'll tell a story what he did. Oh, yeah. Oh, he went crazy, and I have a story about what he did on Good Day LA, and my jaw dropped, but that's for later. But Steve K. is the real deal, did a lot of the work, actually prepared a lot of the legal precedent for, that Vincent. Went for Vincent. Vincent, but I was think, in liked the, the liked, he liked he being was a, in the front. He's a megalomaniac. Yeah, he liked the camera attention. Yeah. He liked yeah. the watch yeah. not working. I yeah. think that's all his. Exactly. Added. Where Stephen was, was the, the worker, was being, the grunter. The grunter yeah. and did the whole thing and then stood by us. Uh, before, the Tate before everything, uh, the victim's rights 
bill was passed um, 10 years after getting quote unquote life in prison, mom gets a phone call from Stephen informing her that the killers, Susan Adkins and uh, Tex, Tex Watson, Watson and Patricia Krenwinkel had accumulated 600, I believe, signatures for their release. release. 600. And not Stephen, parole, Stephen, release. Release. Uh, release. Like parole, parole, parole. But then eventually yes. that leads to okay. freedom. Yep. Yes. It's the minute they walk out the door, that's release. That's release. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Even if they break parole, they're out there and that's it. You know, that's that's the bottom line. So my mother's name was Doris Gwendolyn Tate. To anybody that knew her and loved her, she was Gwynny. Gwynny. And Stephen said, Gwynny, do you think you can do better? And I saw the lights go on for the first time in 10 years. Because my mother was, the lights were on, but nobody was home. Oh, there that, were times that she was highly functioning, but it could be a, things that, I mean, I wasn't privy to, nor was anybody else. The way a leaf blew across the sidewalk and made a certain noise, and all of a sudden she'd go back to that Tom day him. when she first heard the news completely crumble, you know, or a song, or Who just wouldn't? what a Who thought. Wouldn't? Who could, could, so, so she would be highly functioning and then not functioning at all. Highly functioning and up and down and up and down. And did that make you become a, the mother in yeah. some ways did Patty? Well, I was the mother immediately. I would prepare the lunch. I would make sure it was either prepared lunch or I had school money. Um, she would come home from school and I'd sit her down. Do you have homework? The same that any parents do. I tried my very best to keep the house. When your mom was down, would she stay in her room? She'd stay in her room. Because I think yeah. it was such a public tragedy, but privately the trauma of it just oh. had to be well everlasting the, and you couldn't and we were it was like being a prisoner yeah. in your home because the media was in the driveway at the door for weeks and weeks actually turned into months it was a media circus. circus and to tell you how bad the media was they went to Stephen parents I think it was Janet yeah, sister and they saw a picture you know when back in the day yes. on your tv you'd have a picture of your school you know in a frame high have school you. picture yeah they they fucking stole a picture of him right out from the parents home and th they put it up on the news and if i'm not mistaken didn't the mother see a picture of her son on the news that's correct and this is how she they were brutal the media was disgusting and because add to that it's a famous beautiful woman who's in the, she's giving birth like if she would have given birth that day the baby would have been completely fully and healthy it was she was two weeks away she was viably pregnant Viab oh, so yeah baby would have been born at that day it could have been born and had a perfectly healthy life she was two weeks away how many people give birth two weeks before they're due to everybody so uh, it's a complete circus and how fast does your dad get back dad got back pretty damn fast yeah now i didn't see dad when he first got back he went to the scene to the scene no yeah, dad went to the scene. And by the time he got back to the house, he had spent probably a good eight to 10 hours. I'm just oh, guessing. God. I don't know how long. I'm sure that he wasn't walking up and down the street. I'm yeah. sure he was there. He was interviewing cops. And I want He was I, disturbed. He expressed the fact that he was disturbed about how they were handling the crime were scene. They were trampling all... There are pictures. I can look at the crime scene photos to this day and say, holy shit. There were pictures of people just walking everywhere. Willy-nilly. Willy-nilly. And also, I know there are famous ones, and I don't know if it was for life, where Roman was sitting and he's standing at the opening of the door where they had written Pig and oh. Sharon's Blood. Uh, so your father saw all this before Roman because he didn't fly back, I think. Right. Until he came back a little bit after because he was already, he was in England, so he had to... He had to get a, a flight. Fl um, yeah. I called Roman and thought I was the first one to call Roman for many, many, many years. Oh. But indeed... Bill had Bill got Tenet. to him first, thank God. I, I just remember I had to get, after Dad, Roman on the phone. And, um, and he came to the phone. In retrospect, I heard him crying and broken mm. even before I said hello 
Oh. You know, so he had already heard, but he came to the phone to talk to me. Who was Bill? Bill, Bill Tennant. Tennant. He's the one who saw the bodies. He called him too. Yeah. yeah. And so what he said was there's oh, been a tragedy Bill. at a house. And didn't right. he say whose house? And yeah. he said yours. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from all of that, and if you go to archival footage, which I have, you see Deb and Patty at the funeral and you realize how young, and I know that you had a boyfriend at the time, but you're still a young girl you're a, coming into womanhood 17 now at this point i think yeah patty 11 with their black veils you see doris and you see obviously everyone um i thought i was doing so well but i look at those pictures oh, and i can baby. tell i was just a shell i was a you shell were shock- the, yeah. the, the, i was a shell the faces the shock i want to get back to your mother because i remember seeing videos of her facing these killers and not not only not breaking down mm-hmm. having the wherewithal to say calling them sir, sir. look well, that's, sir that's a southern thing she said sir to the mm-hmm. man who did this uh, you know w- what sympathy did you give my daughter blah, blah blah and i thought oh my god this woman i love this woman she's a hero do you feel like because you said the light came on in your mother because it's like you can't fix it you feel helpless like what can Correct. you do so when he says can you help me with this so that's where her advocacy was born. That's absolutely the moment her advocacy wow. was born. That gives me and, chills. And it gave yeah. her a purpose. Yeah, she could do and something for And the purpose at that point, in that moment, was... Now, this is conjecture, totally, but I think that she was in her full capacity and knew there was nothing she could do for Sharon. At this point. At this point. Except. Except. Yes. Make sure... That these people, or do her damnedest to make sure that these people stayed Never where see they the light were. Of day. Be- because they will do it again. These are predatory killers. They did do it again. They, they did it did. again the next night to and the lobby And the next Biancas. night, and the next night, well, and the next night. Did you just see the news report? They found some bodies out in... Um, the no, desert. I mm-hmm. didn't see that. Yeah, interestingly enough. And automatically, because there's so many missing, there were so many hippies and hitchhikers back then. There's a Jane Doe. There's a girl from Montreal. Like, there are stories upon stories that link these people, but... I have a volunteer forensic team that's made up out of some of the greatest minds we have today. Forensically. Forensically. A DNA specialist, a mass spectrometer, a human decomposition experts. And we know damn well that there are other victims of the Manson family out there. And oddly enough, these scientific facts line up exactly with stories that were told by Manson family members in different periods. They weren't together in the same jail. Anyway, um, I wrote Charlie and I asked Charlie about this. And he... Charlie Manson. Charlie Manson wrote me back. And it's an interesting little letter. I can see through and see the logic in his words, okay? I don't believe that the man's insane. I think that he was a criminal genius, but I don't buy into the psychobabble bullshit. Mm. So you take, it's like breaking a code. You take every third word out. (laughs) There's two words of babble and one of (laughs) sense. You know, there's a little code. And he drew a little picture exactly of the Panamint Mountains. If you were standing because I went out there while the science team did their thing. I saw the science work with my own eyes. I ran it up the flagpole to then Attorney General of California, Jerry Brown, and asking permission to please allow us to dig out there. He was going to let that happen. As his foot went from Attorney General to Governor, Hmm. all of a sudden I got a different answer from the office. And at that time, Jerry Brown came onto the show and I'm watching the show. Oh my God. And this was, sorry, just to back up one, yeah. just so I understand. Wow. This was to visit wow. a ranch where the Manson family- To Barker fam- Ranch, where Bar- Manson, ah. that's where they were arrested. To dig and, and to see. And where the stories mm. given by the killers match uh, a confession, basically, from Charlie. He had exes. Marking the exact coordinates that match with the GPS readings on all of these markers. Like coordinates. Coordinates of these markers that are present for human decomposition. Now, how the hell would he know that? How would he know? Of course. This is insanity, right? So before we get to the Governor Jerry Brown story, 
in answer to your question, Liz, when Stephen K asked her, how well do you think we could do? Now Deb has a website up. It's called no parole for Manson family.com. And it's very easy. It's a click. You can go on. There's pictures of the people that are up. You click on their picture, you sign. It takes 30 seconds. There's also a brief Back, synopsis of yeah, who they yes, did and what, what they happened. did. And, and there, you may agree with some and not with others. That's and, all. But today it takes 30 seconds. Back when her mother, when the light went on, it was old school. So she would go to grocery stores. Grocery she stores. Would, I would hang out in but, front of Poncho's Bar in Manhattan wasn't Beach. Wasn't the Inquirer like the big? Inquirer the Inquirer was huge. took out. So there was a page they did. And it's if you don't want these people, these murderers, out on the streets breathing the same air your kids do or you do, sign here. Guess how many signatures the Tate family was able to procure. Through the National Enquirer. Through yes. everything, through their own gar- g- running to the grocery store and handing out, you know, getting people to sign. You know, when you go to the grocery store and people are out front, yeah. would you sign this to the Enquirer? So, I would go to bars. I would go yeah. to churches. I would go to school, you know, schools anywhere where people would. So the would bad guys together. had 600 signatures. And then the good guys, I want to say. 300,000. Oh, almost 400,000. Thousand. From just putting your... Yeah. Feet to the ground, yeah. a clipboard in your hands. Which is, wow. which is how... Yeah. That's incredible. Which is yeah. how I'm still doing it today. Your voice matters, okay? It does have an influence. A lot of people say, well, what can one person do? A lot of people oh. say, they'll never get they'll out. They'll never go, get out. Um, let me just tell you. Yeah, they will, because I've been to hearings with her. And you get eight hours, nine hours of their glowing review. And then the family speaks for three minutes. The parole board's getting younger. Yes, they will. And it's recently, not just that. There's been laws passed, passed by Jerry Brown. The, the, the elderly, elderly law. Elderly Inmate Act, which basically states whether they're suitable for parole or not. Or not. They must be given a date, a release date, if they're over 60, 60. years old. I thought because, it was 65. No, oh it's 60. God. Do you know how much damage I could do? Yeah. At 60? Yeah. I am not a little old no. You know, crotchety And neither are they. By the way, and when they neither come in, are they. they do try to look like I was, it's like the Harvey yeah. Weinstein. You yeah. know, he's got the tennis ball and the walker. Mm-hmm. The first parole hearing I went to with you was, uh, was Patricia Adkins. And she comes in all shackled and trying to look old. And I think with Charlie, he didn't even want to see you. At no, some Charlie, of he didn't want to Charlie see her. wouldn't come in with me. I went to two. <laughs> he didn't show up. He's like, Fuck, I'm yeah. not going. I'm not, yeah, I'm not they, facing her. The, the guards said you know that he came into the room because nobody went to a charles manson hearing and steve k didn't want me to go either but he saw me sitting in there and said who's that and they said that's her sister and he said put my leg shackles back on and take me to my cell oh whoa yeah. crazy as a fox right yeah. he knew he's smart so you two yeah. never face to face no and i went five years after that and, and he then didn't show up again he didn't right? show up he again. said no thanks turn and around then he was supposed to have another and um instead he was in the hospital uh i was told on the second one the warden came in and talked to me and and without saying because of HEPA laws, he said he didn't think that there would be another one. Well, there should have been another one. And another one after that. But Charlie was always in the hospital. Infirmary, in yeah, something going on. Something going yeah, on that he, had he couldn't a lot of do it. Health issues. And but, even when they don't come in, if they forfeit at the last minute, the parole hearing happens without them. Oh, yeah. in their absence. In their absence. But the attorney isn't there to put their spin. Everything is a spin. Attorneys oh, do in there exactly what they do anywhere it, else. It's so the did, craziest thing I've ever seen. So she and goes, they have no rules, but we have all the rules in the world uh, on their on the yeah. family on the victim side. It's the craziest thing. I remember the first time I was like, "Wait a minute, we've just spent nine hours with a couple of breaks." listening to her sob story and her lawyers speaking for her. And how much time do you get? So Deb would have three, four minutes to talk about Sharon and the impact on her family. And then the LaBiancas would get three or four minutes to talk about it. Stephen Kay's family and so on. And so, and um, the last one that I did was Tex Watson and they said another five years. And I spoke on behalf of the LaBianca family. Uh, JC Brings Nephew spoke on behalf of Jay, of course, Deb spoke, but Deb is, you're very matter of fact and less emotional. I remember saying to Tony LaBianca, I want to be able to say something at the end. I wanted to say to this man, you have fathered, I could not say, sir, like your mom is so polite. 
you fathered four children. You denied Sharon the right to have one. Like I wanted to say, fuck you. But you know, having the impact, having at least the, the ability, but I was a little concerned because I remember one of the parole ladies was very, she had a very sweet voice. Anyway, they did the right thing. But most recently, Leslie Van Houten got paroled and she's the one everyone, oh, she was the youngest, 19. Okay, so what? She slaughtered Rosemary LaBianca. I don't understand. I don't care how old she was. There are people at 19 get married and have babies. I'm well, concerned. first it was, she only stabbed post-mortem two times with a pocket knife. Last parole hearing, she admitted to 14 times with a bayonet, bayonet, you know, and she doesn't know postmortem or never did, didn't think about if it was a lot, she was alive or dead. You know, these people, the We're fact, the, the fact is, is that they haven't even come to terms in 50 freaking years. You cannot search your soul and and play the footage back in your head and figure out if you were in the wrong or in the right they've never you, apologized they've outside never apologized. of only during hearings they will crocodile apologize teams. phony phony Cro- <laughs> you should see them the, the acting it's that pitiful. goes on it's it's like an academy award-winning like but have no never, tears no the, tears the but- la bianca mm-hmm. family for 19 years at the end of every statement they they ask they beg for a letter or something and they will never give it to them it's a pat they get an actual leslie van houten gets a little passive aggressive smirk on her face i want to go back just yes. to the point where because i think it's interesting jerry brown yes. on Godele, and also how Vince. you eventually you two connected and end up going to parole hearings together well, because that is we were conne- we connected over the star on the walk of fame so I think, you know, Deb's got a lot of people oh, that are sycophants. Oh, you call the house and the 16-year-old daughter. Yeah, but there's a lot of you. sycophants. Yes, but they knew that I was on TV. And yeah. I think you knew that I was real. But I'm also a reporter, like type person. I'm not a reporter, but like a on-air personality. I could be a fucking weirdo. She doesn't know. Yes, Lord we, knows I've met plenty yes. of them. So she's got to be guarded and everything. Over the years, our friendship blossoms. Uh, she knows my intentions. And... We had Vincent Bugliosi on Godele. And I remember walking in. I think you had called me not long before. And one of the murderers, Susan Adkins, who had already had her legs, I believe, chopped off because of... Um, brain cancer. No, no. She had oh. diabetes. And then she got brain okay. cancer. And so she so wanted had out... amputated from diabetes. Yeah. Oh. And then she got brain cancer. She had married in prison, a lawyer. And he was asking that she be released on compassion Compassion. A compassionate release. So I was like, what the fuck is that? What? No. So Vincent Bugliosi comes on the show and I walk into the green room and I've met him several times and I go to say hello. And I said, um, I'm a friend of Deborah's, Tate's. Nice to see you again. And he was there to promote some book that he had written, some novel about angels and devils and blah, blah, blah. So I said, can you believe, on a side note, can you believe that Susan Adkins wants, oh, this is the man that, supposedly worked so hard to put her behind bars and the rest of the killers. It certainly made him famous. It certainly it did. It was the basis of his entire career. Now, mind you, after the Tate LaBianca trials, he quit the Los Angeles DA's office to go into... Didn't in, he end up going into the private sector? Didn't private he end up doing... Uh, I don't know if he did defense attorney work, but I'll tell you what... He was a different person. When I said, can you believe she wants out on compassionate? Like what compassion did, before I could get it out, he goes, Jillian, stop. I am not here to talk about it. Some people are sorry for what they did and da, da, da. And I was so taken aback. I'm like, I don't give a fuck if she's sorry now, right? Like what? She slaughtered Sharon. Like what? So I'm taking ba- steps backwards and I'm like, I got to call Deb. I got to call. I, I don't understand what's happening. So I'm thinking maybe she knows more than I do about Vincent. She's like, yeah, I think he's sprung a leak. He's lost it. So I'm like, fuck him. I'm going to say it on air. So I say it on air. Jeez. I'm like, can you believe this woman? I go, what compassion did she show Sharon Tate while she was doing what she did to her? And he looks at me and gets again, very agitated and says, Jillian, I'm not here to talk about that. That's in the past. I'm here to talk about the book. Da, da, da. But it, I, I was like, as le- I'm showing some colors. Like, you're the man who supposedly was doing 
good against evil. And now what's going on with you? Are, he, did you sell out? Somewhere? He did. He sold out. He sold out. They did a second filming of Helter Skelter, which was at the time in the early 80s, the most viewed show. Oh, it on, was a documentary. Made, made for TV made movie. Made for TV movie. movie. And it was huge. And this is before documentaries yeah. became really yeah. what they... Mm-hmm. Uh, so they did that. And, and that was, was off of his Helter Skelter book. And then they wanted to do it again. And he completely flipped the story and these poor innocent kids you know taken advantage of that's where the concept changed about these people because the public perception that's right it was the 80s was, you're right yeah the public perception was that the people the murderers were victims okay he flipped it and why because the man's a megalomaniac and he has to hear the sound of his own voice so what if he's you know changing his moral compass or or whatever just to have the opportunity to say just to have the opportunity to make another million or two it fucking threw me for a loop i will say that yeah well and then deb and i you know, we're like, you know, what can we do? do, What can be done? So that's when I think we started brainstorming and came up with the website, the no parole for Manson family. Right. Dot com. And then got a bunch of signatures. With the the wonderful help of my AJ. Oh my God. It was a godsend. Yeah. There was a few people that really helped with this. And AJ is like an angel, was able to get 140,000 signatures. They don't just go, okay, it's online. We could, no, 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 you have to get them printed out. We had to go to fucking Kinko's up in God Sacramento Kinko's. Yeah. And, <laughs> and have like filing uh, rolling dollies filled with boxes of paperwork to show up at the governor's office. And at the time it was Jerry Brown and we just showed up unexpectedly and what happened from there, Deb? <laughs> then they say, oh, the governor's just left the building. Just left the building. Oh my well, God, funny. He was just there with the Dalai Lama five minutes ago. Out the back. Okay. Yeah. Of but- course I can see through the glass the woman that says he's not there standing in the doorway talking to someone. You know, it's a total bust. Okay, he's not there. Then who, what, who are you talking to? The chair? You're talking to the chair lady, <laughs> the empty well, chair. They were able to put all the stacks. The lo- some of the LaBiancas came up. It was Lou. Lou and uh, Tony. And Tony. Tony is a Lino LaBianca's son. I want to mention on a crazy note, and I don't know if this is true. I've read it. it it's in Helter Skelter, but you, you know much more about these things. That when Lino and Rosemary were coming back from a boating trip the next night, while they stopped off to get food... And she saw the front page of the paper with Sharon's picture. And she was talking to the newspaper guy outside. And she said, oh, my God, this is horrible. And this was about midnight. And like 1 a.m., she would be the next victim. Correct. Oh. Can you believe that? And Manson actually she- went in and tied them up and left. And then the others came in and did the business. Event. That is correct. Oh. Well, Manson tied them up. The others were, were there. But he left. And he acted like, and you're going to be fine. Don't worry. Right. He mm-hmm. didn't want them to panic. Just a he, robbery. Because he felt the night before was too... Chaotic. Chaotic. Well, too messy. Because Hold people were point. running all over the place for right. their lives. Yeah. Uh, we left the papers. And G- Governor Jerry Brown, again, that was for Leslie, wasn't it? Was that for Leslie the first time? We it were, was for Leslie. That's we were cons- why the LaBiancas were with us. Because... Here's a woman, like, really? She's going to get paroled? And he overturned it. Then Gavin Newsom comes into power, and we're like, uh-oh, because he's more liberal, and he doesn't want the death penalty on the on the docket. And I was I was very skeptical. Deb, you never, you're always, you, you, she never goes in like, oh, we've got this, ever, because you don't know. You don't know. No. It's you a have, crapshoot. You have to fight. You, fight, you fight, have fight. to fight for your life. Never assume anything. And actually, I thought when Gavin was elected, I thought, oh, shit, here goes everything. Because Jerry is an extreme liberal, but Gavin was just a little more liberal. Yes. But I must yeah. say the man has done right. He overturned it. By us yep. and by a lot of other super heinous yeah, criminals. Uh, criminals. Now, I have to really stress the fact that I am grateful that I get to go and speak up against these killers. Even though it is a daunting task, 
I at least have the ability to say something. Think of all of, we are one of five states that still has the position where a governor can overturn a parole board's decision. What about all the people in all of those states where you don't get any You don't have say. a say. You have no you say. You can get a you million don't, signatures. You don't have a, the governor's safety net, mm -hmm. you know? So thank God. Gavin, I was wrong. Yes. Gavin ha is in his I right had faith. mind. I did have faith. I said, okay, the, got down to this. I'm like, okay, we follow each other on Twitter. If I have to send him a DM and say, please, you have children. You know, I don't care how old these people are getting. Their mindset is a different, it's a whole different. And by the way, the ones that aren't in prison, they still have websites that are dedicated to. Not only that, Manson they're all and, still friends. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. They're, they all still have oh, an members of the Manson family. That is oh, yeah. correct. Oh yeah. That is correct. They yeah. still communicate. If these people were reformed in any way, shape or they form. They wouldn't have anything to do with each other. They would have nothing to do with each other. Nothing at all. You know what you earlier said, you know, I could have been this or I could have been this. And then you just said how grateful you are that you have this opportunity to be this advocate. I just think, gosh, on that day that you're, you found out your sister had been murdered. I mean, your life took a completely I took a really direction forever. A really hard turn. Yeah. Uh, Was forced on you. I don't yeah. want to say harder than other people, but dad retired to go and and go didn't he live so in the mountains he for a went while undercover no? he went right back oh. as soon as the funeral was over he went right back to Sausalito and lived on a houseboat and went undercover there because uh, there was a reason for him to believe that Jay may have gotten in with some dicey people so and his his jump off point was going to be Sausalito and um he witnessed some hardcore stuff, not having anything to do with Jay, but Black Panther activity and mm -hmm. stuff that, that he turned in on. So not only was my mother out to lunch, my dad was out crawling around in the bushes looking Trying for to find, clues. Yeah. Uh, like a sleuth. Like he like became his own detective. Well, that's what he did in the military. Yeah. G2 is, is intelligence and counterintelligence. He was a spy. My father was a spy. And he and spied. A, and he went, didn't he go to a the house? And, and yes, he did. He went to the house and like laid in the bushes waiting right. to see the comings and goings, goings. and to see bikers. And you keep your mouth shut and your yeah. eyes open, sugar, yeah. is what he'd say to me. You keep your mouth shut and your eyes open, sugar. So uh, after all of these years, you mentioned the 80s. I remember uh, Axl Rose wanting to record some Manson songs, him having the picture of Charlie on there, people being outraged. I don't know if you remember all this. So there was this resurgence. There were always these movies. Then came some biographies, documentaries about Sharon's life, which I thought was great, but not enough. They were always about the killers, the killers, the killers. Fast forward to, you've been approached by many people to do, because you own Sharon's life rights. And Roman, her... Roman signed those over to me. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, he signed, uh, made dad the executor of her estate, estate here in Los Angeles, uh, just the physical estate. He always retained intellectual and artistic licensing until he gave that to me. Do you still speak to Roman at yes, all? Yes, I do. Oh. I love Roman. Yeah. I you do. know, when all of this, so I'm curious because she got a, gets approached by different people that want to do different projects. I'll just tell you quickly from my side, she was approached by Quentin Tarantino. And my first reaction was, yes, that's the one we go with because Quentin has a way, and I remember saying this to you, of rewriting history. It was my dream, but I never thought in a million years. I didn't know, but I thought if anyone can do this movie. And I felt, what happened when you got the call? How did he get a hold of you? What happened? What transpired? Because you guys ended up spending a lot of time together. Uh, Gene Kurtowski, Roman's Gene. best friend, his son or stepson, actually, Adam Bardock, who is a producer and his attorney is one of Quentin's attorneys. So when oh, Quentin wanted wow. to reach me, you know, in conversation, I got to find, dig me up, Deborah Tate, blah, blah, blah. His attorney approached oh. Adam. Adam called me and said, I don't know if you want to, you don't want to, but here's the information. Call Quentin. Quentin actually got a hold of me. 
Quentin gave me the script to take home. Was it already called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood it at that sure point? It sure was. I, yeah. I'll tell you nice. what. There's a, there's a funny... You're so good. She didn't say a word. She kept her mouth zipped and because I know you had an agreement with Quentin. But you, I gave him you, my word. My yeah. word is... It's gold. Better she than didn't, you a, didn't even a tell me. Disclosure. She agreement. did not say the name of it. She just she read it. Not until we went to the premiere together. You said zero point zero, and I didn't want to know. But I he I, let you read the script. Yes. Oh, uh, and this is a, if yes. you look at Brad before Pitt. Brad Pitt you, yeah. He says that she read it before Brad. But the thing is, is it's Quentin's original script, and Brad told a story where one time you read it, it's got a couple of stains and a couple of dog ears, and the next time it goes around, it's got a coffee cup ring. Well, <laughs> I, that's the same script I had. Yeah. On my bed, and I'm reading it in my bed, and I've got papers up and papers down and sticking out of my piles on things I want to revisit the way I read things because you're absorbing your sister's I'm absorbing life this and whole her thing. yeah and this is and her... I knew I was going to go back and see Quentin the next day and I had to have notes my notes in my head I didn't write notes I never do I just did know. he know at that point he was going to play her in the part yes he knew exactly what he was doing by then but previous to that, there was a TMZ approached me with a Who'd You Rather with oh, Jennifer God, Lawrence and Margot Robbie, and I just shot, a, shot right off the top. Margot. He said, why? Well, you know, well, look I, at Margo. I'm, I'm kind of uncensored. I, I said, <laughs> because Jennifer's not pretty enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, took my shit God, for that. did I ever take shit for that. Now, mm, Jennifer yeah. is Beautiful. Beautiful. And course. I identify with her and my look or my level or what I should say, what I was when I was her age. I could totally identify with that. But Sharon was a showstopper. Like Margot she Robbie. Didn't, yeah, she couldn't blend into a crowd on, you know, if she, if tried. she tried. So I... That that was my reasoning, not having anything. And at that point, but you didn't her. know she had been cast. No. but she <laughs> Is that crazy? When you yeah. read the script, because so much of that movie when Sharon is on screen oh. is just the most beautiful visuals, but she doesn't necessarily have lines. No. So when you're reading the script, how were you understanding his vision to go back and talk to him about it the next day? Well, I had my questions and he explained his vision and how he saw mm. things and it... It made sense, but there were a few things that really needed to change. I remember you saying to me, I don't know if I like her as, you didn't, without giving anything away, you said, I don't know if I like certain things about this. And I know you asked him about it and he kept reassuring you. And I remember the night of the premiere when we were sitting there. I actually questioned him on whether or not he could pull it off. I told him, <laughs> me, Deborah Tate's telling <laughs> Quentin, Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino. In particular, it was the Steve McQueen character. I said, how can you pull this off? These are very famous people. I've seen this try to happen in other movies, and it's pretty much always the kiss of death. Quentin knew he could do it. You mean and the actor made, himself, the, yes, the British actor who played from... Yes, from uh, and all of the other famous characters that are very oh, yeah. briefly on screen. Oh, Mama but still, Cass. How and, the yeah. hell can you pull this stuff off? <laughs> and yeah. and I asked him just like that. You know, I said, this, this is really going to be a tough one. I didn't have much faith in the man <laughs> in that regard. But in his explanation, you know what? I knew that he could do it. And that's pretty much the way it was with anything that I had questioned. I did have a couple of staunch points mm -hmm. that he took into consideration and pretty much kept. When you read the script, did you feel like when I was watching it with you, I felt it was a love letter, not only to Hollywood, but to Sharon, because when they played her on yes. screen, mm -hmm. I remember saying to Deb, oh my God, we're sitting here with... Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt and there's Sharon. He brought her to life. He and didn't... when he talked to me about that scene, he was like a kid in a candy store. He was so excited over that visual of, of that watching, watching Sharon, what is supposed to be Sharon from the back. It's really Margot from the back. Watching Herself. her, the real Sharon on screen, mm -hmm. 
He was so excited over that. And the movie she was, was watching delicious. was... was a, real Sharon footage. It was, it was 13 Mad Shares. Hel- no, no, it was it Matt was, Helm. Uh, the Dean Martin. Dean Martin, yes. She's very funny, and she has all of these physically... It's called Wrecking Crew. Wrecking Crew. I'm Duh. sorry, I had a senior moment. So there. did I. The Wrecking <laughs> Crew. And she has great physical comedy scenes where she falls, and there's Pratt falls, and there's moments where she gets to have the funny one-liners. And so I thought, I love that he picked that particular Matt Helm movie because it really showcased that fun side of her as opposed to we've been listening for so many years about the death and destruction Deb said something to me before we get back to Quentin I remember you once said to me you know this woman had 26 blessed years I mean she was always the most beautiful she was the kindest the sweetest she had a great career she wanted to be a mom she'd probably rather that than anything else she had a husband and this life in Beverly Hills the last 45 minutes of her life were hell on earth but the first 26 years and i remember you saying that and they it were really blessed blessed yeah absolutely blessed and speaking of that when you read the script and then even seeing the movie how hard was that for you to see like i mean of course you would have wished that was the ending the fairy tale oh, ending if only so, i said if only reading that script i would have been like oh god i mean this is the fairy tale i wish had happened exactly oh i went Back to the hotel to after reading Quentin, the first with, three quarters right. of the script and we discussed everything until about 10 or 11 o'clock at night ending ending it at the bar we i always go home uh he's a perfect gentleman by yeah. the way did but, he have to speak to you going back to you have the rights to your sister's life story so in order to include her he had to basically get you to sign off and be involved no he did not. God, then how respectful and amazing yes. of him that he did that. Now, yes. people, That's incredible. I, I, I can, love that he I did I can it. choose whether or not I want to go after somebody or not. Technically, they do not have to. A lot of people, most productions, go ahead and blow it off. But I can come after you, and I will win under yeah. those circumstances she, she because I up. own the licensing. He did the right thing yeah. without being asked or told. And I also He's said so to Deb charming. at the time, he is a charming guy, but I also said to Deb at the time, he wants your insight, your stamp of approval, because that gives the film validity. It also showcases that he's done his homework. Yes. And then Deb, you met with Margot Robbie. Tell us a little bit about that experience, because here's the woman that's going to portray the woman that you knew. Oh my gosh. So what? That, so that, she that. came down and she met with me and spent an afternoon with me. On set. <clears throat> No, before set. Actually, in my friend Catherine's house, because I didn't want her to have to drive all the way to Santa Barbara. So we we, uh, picked a a, a mutual place, middle middle, ground. Middle ground, um, but a private place because Margot, like Sharon, stands out in a crowd and and we had work to do so yeah, she wouldn't had work at starbucks right yeah, yeah. she she <laughs> asked very specific questions trying to get gestures we did walking talking laughing had questions she held my beautiful little bacon puppy <laughs> i've got great pictures of that but i instantly liked Margot. And is not affected by the Hollywood. Not affected yeah. at all. It and not affected like by it. her be- beauty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she you is know? one great beauty. I she... just saw her the other night and I was like, yeah, you, you, this just, wow, you stare at that face. Now, it's not Sharon's face. No. Nope. But no face will ever be no. Sharon's face. Mm-hmm. So you've got to capture her essence. spirit, her essence. And Margot did it. Oh. She did it. She nailed it. And I don't think you can act that either i think the reason she did it is because she has it yeah she's mm-hmm. authentic too. she's authentic now yeah. go back to you said you were in the hotel room with quentin you'd with read three quentin fourths three of the quarters script. and i come back in the next day we spend an entire day discussing things and him explaining my questions away by almost going through a, a directorial vision You've got words on a page in black and white. You can't mm-hmm. see what's in a director's head. Especially his head. Especially it's Quentin. his head. <laughs> Actually, we had a wonderful interlude in the beginning. I'm going to back up and share that for a minute. So we meet. Hello. And he says, looks down at his feet and kind of said, this is, Quentin's a big guy. Looks down at his feet and says, uh, so uh, I hear you're kind of a badass. <laughs> I he? said, "Who me? <laughs> a little bit." Mm-hmm. 
I wow. said not me, and I really meant it. I said, and I Wonder, said, what not is he me. referring to? I wonder what he heard. Was it just you're facing the the the? Maybe that. Maybe the fact that I stand up and mm -hmm. you know say what I think or or what. Who knows why yeah. he said that? But I was taken aback. I said, who me? <laughs> not me. And then I said, well, maybe. <laughs> it depends on what side of the fence you're sitting on. <laughs> I said, no, it's a Tate thing. I said, everybody starts with 100 points and then you start earning your demerits. He said, you know, I like that. I think I'm going to adopt that from <laughs> now on. <laughs> I give you a chance. In, my mother would and father would say, you give them enough rope, they'll hang themselves. Mm. So I give it, everybody gets the same chance. You could be an ax murderer or a Manson murderer and come at me the right way with honesty and purity of heart. I will see it, feel it and let you have your chance. You have, and I can speak to that firsthand at the hearings. You have always spoken to the murderers with respect. And she always says, you know, I don't hold a grudge against you. I, I, I wish you the best because, you know, but I don't think you deserve to be out. And, mm -hmm. and that's where, you know, we all agree you did these heinous things. You shouldn't be free to breathe the same air that I'm breathing. Cause I, I want my kids to be safe. Okay. That's one thing I've, I've learned from you. And I think you got that from your mom, right? Do you think Doris? Cause she was so very decent to these people. I would have lunged across the table and punched them in the fucking face. I, I don't know what well, I Well, back in the day when dad went to those trials and I wanted to go to those trials, he says, no, no. He, he, you can't go because back in the day, if there was anybody that was going to go across a table, It'd be you. it was going to be me. Yeah. So and you I, are a badass. I could, yeah. I could, I could <laughs> take you. Right. I could take you out with one thumb behind your larynx and pop it out. I she mean, can. She doesn't fuck I around. Can. I know. Well, I can and I would, especially <laughs> back in those in days. that day during the trial. First of all, back in those days, death penalty. I wasn't on board with the death penalty back then. I didn't know that. No, I was really? not. Really, because it made me feel like I was taking a life, just mm. like they had done to me. And then I grew up and I started seeing what our societal problems are. And I would much rather take the money that this state spends on supporting. Now, each it has to be a case by case scenario. scenario. Yes. We can't have blanket laws. Everything has to be looked at as an individual. But when you have a rabid animal, you take it out. Mm -hmm. It's it's just that that's it. That simple. I don't believe because it's gonna in do it all again. of these appeals. You know, the heinous predatory killers in this state usually die of natural causes in old age. Well, because they have so many appeals, right? Exactly. So they, they end and up guess who's out. paying for those appeals? Leslie Van yeah. Houten. You don't know. Yeah. Okay, she was overturned in the superior court. They kicked it back. Her attorney sat in front of the California appeals court and said i don't care i'm filing again and we will file again and again, again and, and again. again and again and guess what they did and they did so right now she's got another parole hearing she's got an appeals case in the superior court and in the appeals court all at the same time so these are things that she all goes to on taxpayer dollars yeah okay i personally know we all know but i mean i've researched the knowledge involved the only cure for criminality is education yeah so if not in the case of sociopaths or psychopaths but everybody they're else too far gone. That they're too far gone quite <laughs> frankly um that's a personality factor and a psychological factor that will never change so they should never be trusted in a free society that's what these people are they are sociopath you are not diagnosed a sociopath yesterday and then 50 years later say you're no longer a sociopath if you have those personality factors you will die with those personality factors you are first a narcissist yes. then you can escalate into to a, sociopath. a sociopath and then you can escalate to a psychopath you can go from psychopath back down to sociopath but, you but can't you're go... never going yeah. back down to normal yeah. not even a narcissist okay so we know they aren't coming back. I'm sorry, they're not coming back. They're not the same people. If they're high functioning in a controlled society, i.e. prison, where they can't hurt anybody else, I am so for it. And mm -hmm. I say, God bless your 
your program training companion dogs. I am so glad you can help with new incoming inmates, you know. Be highly functioning and normal within these walls, and God bless it. But I'm sorry, I can't trust that you're ever coming back because oh, all the science in the world that? says you're not, mm -hmm. that you should not be trusted. And if you're capable of doing what they did for shits and giggles for is what they did it. It exactly. was just for nothing more than that. There was no thought behind it other than they knew the layout of the house. There was no passion. There, there was no, there was not, there was there just. There was no nothing. It, it was, was carnage. It, it was, was absolute, utter. For predatory for, reasons. Yes. Correct. So just to kill. I don't care how old you are. If you're 19 or you're 25, you were capable of doing that. Then you're, you're capable again. And I want to mention, because we've heard so much about the Manson family and what they're capable of. I want to mention what is a beautiful tribute is a book that you did uh, called Recollection about Sharon's life. And I think it's important because Deb, when all of those photographers that took those thousands and thousands of pictures, they have the rights, essentially. Deb, because of her relationship, because of the photographer's relationship with Sharon and how much they loved her, Deb would call them and say, right, I want to use this photo. And they're like, okay. She went to 20th Century so, Fox. How many? I did have to buy a picture from 20th Century Fox. Everybody else gave, gave. me, gave me the picture. And the her book, on red carpets and movies uh, and beauty. Various things. Everything. Oh, and okay. then and I, it, oh. I would get not just my recollections of Sharon. As, as a matter of fact, I only have a couple in there. But go to friends, high school friends. Oh. Uh, actors that worked actors with her, that producers. Worked with her. So because the purpose of the book was to give her a life, to give a new generation of people a snippet of who and what she was. She and did six movies, 250 magazine covers worldwide, basically in six years. Like that's insane. And then at the same time she's doing all this can make each and every person that cross her path feel like they are the only and most important person in the world she was a magnificent spirit a special creature and do you that's think she why i did the book do you think she would have given up hollywood for being a mother i think so yeah i mm -hmm. do too one of the things that you said a little bit ago that you would have been the one if you had gone to these trials been jumping across the table so part of grief is anger and rage yeah. mm -hmm. yes how have you gotten to this place? I mean, to write or to put together, compile a book like Recollection, you have to be in a totally different space. Or to through, face the killers. I've just, seen her face yeah, these people right. and you're so calm. She's very law driven. She's not personal. It's not about her, what happened to her and her it's family. It's not a vendetta. It's not a vendetta. It's exactly. A, it's, I'm fair. I am yeah. fair. I am a Sometimes very fair I'm creature. I'm like, oh my God, like you're, she's so fair. Like I want to get personal. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. The way the journey <laughs> is through self-examination. Mm -hmm. I put myself in check all the time. I think that's why basically I'm still here is because I do put myself in check and I, I try to look at things. I have my point of view and then I try to look at things from every other possible point of view so that I can get a full, deep and understanding of not only the situation, but myself in that situation and sometimes i might be wrong and find that i need to put my a little adjustment a little spin on myself and get that crap or that anger out of me and i jump on the back of a horse and go mm -hmm. you know uh, do 500 miles across the the mojave desert in a little endurance race called the mojave now it's called the mojave 100 by the way back in the day it used to be the mojave 500 <laughs> um, and it's really grueling so i i was crazy in that way i would e express things physically do you feel, I mean, because you just said The Next Generation, and I do think Quentin's movie shows Sharon in a light that mm -hmm. I do. there's a generation that probably didn't even know of her. Exactly. Such a gorgeous energy and light. And you talk about when she passed away, you felt her energy was gone. Right. Do you feel her energy around you at any point you now? You know, I have. I have in the past. It used to be a lot. Mm. And um, there came a point where I had a very weird dream, uh, and I can still do this, but I can do it with other people. I've always been able to, quote unquote, see dead people. I've, I started when I was six years old. I sat up in bed in Italy and said, Mama, Papa's dead. 
and I never had a relationship with my mother's father because we were military and always traveling and I was only six years old, so how much of a relationship did I have? But my grandfather came to me to tell me why he didn't get me a pony and my, my two cousins had them, you know, really. And mm. I knew Papa was dead and he told me at the end of that conversation. He explained why I didn't have a pony and he explained that it was time for him to go and he would see me sometime in the future. So anyway. And he had just passed away? He had just passed away. That's crazy. Oh, 45 yeah. minutes later, the phone call oh my came God. in that he had died. Yeah. I'm curious about you owning the intellectual rights and, and everything of Sharon's. You also own all of her physical items. And we're talking Sharon's life and... That that wasn't stolen. And there is a particular <sighs> individual that has stolen quite a lot. Yeah. So there's an auction that did Marilyn Monroe, it did Audrey Hepburn, it's done Cher, Jane Fonda. Everybody, anybody in Prince, anybody. Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison. And so we did a lot of research and uh, wanted things to go to, you know, a positive place. And you had trunks and bags filled because they were at your dad's for a long time, right? All they, of her stuff. They were at mom in mom's closet, yeah, in a hope chest. So did you ever feel, because I know... I got the responsibility of storing stuff here while Deb was in transition. So I stored basically Sharon's life. So from her coats to her Fendi glasses to her scarves, her makeup. I still have a lot of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, you that yeah. physical connection when you feel it, like it was so personal. I always felt really positive around it. And I didn't want mm -hmm. it here for a long time. I, even though I have an alarm and I have a system, I knew the value. And then it went to Julian's. And but that's an auction house? It is. Yeah, okay. But I felt so positive around when people would say, oh, you have Sharon's picture. Well, yeah, that's from Deb. I love it. It's the picture on the book of recollections. When the clothes were here, I would tell Ruby how important her wedding dress. When you had, because I always felt very positive around it because um, she was so positive. Did you ever feel going through her stuff, giving it to the auction people that it felt like it was tangible or was it sort of like these represented her, but it's not because I always felt like she'd want you to have that but then kind of move on well it's a personal thing for me to guard everything down to the bitter end and that was my intention the reason being I was always fearful of what kind of people because I do know the oh. creepier side I've, I'm approached oh, yeah. all the time I I envisioned you know death worshippers oh, there's a doing lot of the ritual, darkness. the yeah. darkness on her items. So, I mean, I'd be damned if you're going to get something out from underneath my nose. A lot of stuff did go out under the nose of my little sister when she moved into my mother's house after she passed away, and the stuff was still there. And um, another individual actually... Uh, Took a lot. Took of a lot of stuff, and my dad called up and said, "You give all this to Deb. This is Deb's." And the woman returned a lot of it, but helped herself to a lot of it. As my little sister is laying there dying, she was busy ripping everything out of family albums and oh, stuffing things God. up in the attic because she was afraid that I was, was... going to come in right after the funeral and snatch away the dreams. That was the furthest thing from my mind as my little sister died. You know, when Patty died, I almost didn't get back up again. Oh, you know, I'd lost because my mother. I'd lost Sharon. Doris, then I lost my mother. Then I lost your dad Patty. and your dad. Dad, dad was last. the last one. But we didn't talk about Doris had a, a brain, brain tumor, cancer. cancer, glioblastoma. But she did get to meet with President Bush Senior, a thousand points of light, right. and she was one of his thousand points. Yeah, of you light, know how right? Mom got that. Mm. You? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. That's amazing. Me and uh, two ladies from her parents of murdered children. Oh, group. that's incredible. We petitioned the president for that. Do you think with the with the success of Quentin Tarantino's movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that this sort of resurgence of realizing who Sharon Tate was, I wonder if it's a time to revisit the star on the Walk of Fame to bring it full circle how you and I met. I just, I'm curious, because Johnny Grant is no longer around, and I know mm -hmm. for a fact one of his concerns, and I was dumbfounded because I wrote a letter, and um, you know, being in the media at the time, because I knew what you had to do. You had to get a certain amount of people behind you. You had to have like $15,000. They were like concerned that there were going to be Mansonites 
on her star. Like this was going to be some sort of a, a p- oh. meeting place. And I was like, what? It's about Sharon Tate. This isn't about Charles Manson. Um, but they didn't, they didn't get it. And I remember thinking, I felt so pissed off and yet defeated that I remember talking about it on the air saying, have you seen some of these yahoos who have stars on the walk of fame? They're reality idiots. Uh, there are, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like, so I feel like now, if anything, the Hollywood chamber of commerce would realize, but is that something you would even care about at this point? Well, I've revisited that a couple of times. And now that you mention it, it's been a secret, but you know that I'm friends with Dave Navarro. Yes. Dave Navarro. I've given him my blessing. He wants to get Sharon a star and I will sign all the paperwork because a relative I'm the only relative yeah uh, has to sign the paperwork he it's still a battle because they are concerned that oh my god it will attract still? the ugliest element along with the good you know well maybe well, it's ch- kind of like you know people coming up and damaging uh, whose star was it most recently Donald Trump Do- Donald Trump uh, or whatever and th- I might have done that one myself but yeah. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Dave Navarro and Deb have a special relationship. Dave Navarro's mother was murdered. And uh, Um, you might know him from the Red Hot Chili Peppers or from Jane's Addiction. He was married to Carmen Electra. He's one of the coolest people uh, that I know, that you know. And he's an advocate. Uh, He did a whole documentary, if you haven't seen it. It's called Morning Sun, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. I'm glad to hear that. And I think that what better person than, than Dave to get that done. I'm yeah. bummed out to hear that that's still a, an uh, issue uh, that they would as, have. As I would uh, have to, they, the Hollywood Walk of Fame is all about bringing revenue to yeah. Hollywood. So yeah. the whole thing is who can I produce to come forward to present the star? So, I mean, I would receive the star, but I could certainly petition oh. Quentin. Quentin. Margot, uh, exactly. Oh, maybe, come on. maybe, maybe the guys would come out if I was really lucky. Yeah. I must say that the absolutely, by the guys she means Brad and Leo. Uh, Brad and Leo. <laughs> That's what she calls the guys. <laughs> Brad and oh, those Leo. boys. Uh-huh. You know, I must say, really nice, normal, oh, yeah. down to earth, kind, ugly. Yeah, uh, ugly. You can't Not, have. Can't look at them. Yeah. They're so unattractive. Hideous. Uh, Quentin has got an absolutely amazing support. She, team. He puts teams yeah. together that are unbelievable. And he stays I've with never, them forever. And he stays with them yeah. forever. The yeah. vibe on the set is just unreal. You have to check your cell phones in with yeah. Checkpoint Charlie, they call him. So there's no cameras, there's no cell phones, there's no communication. There's no distraction. There's no, distraction. Yeah. There's no bullshit. Yeah. It's all about work, a happy environment. He gives everybody what they need and expects... So them when did you find out that, the end of uh, how he was going to end the at movie? At the end of the three oh. days. And it was explained to me that there were a lot of people, a lot of high-powered people that never got to read that last coveted ending. And I gave him my word. He asked for it. I said, you've got my word. And I'm the kind of gal I give you my word. That's it. Yep. We went to the premiere. She said nothing. I was excited to see how he was going to portray it. And uh, I asked him, I said, you know, I'm going to have to say something to Roman. And I need, I need to ask you what I can say. And he started talking. I said, look, can I just say this? Can I say, it's not going to be what you would expect. And he said, yeah, that would be okay. So that's all I would tell anybody. In the beginning of meeting with him, I said, you know, given the subject of the Manson murders and Quentin Tarantino, there's an automatic leap that takes place in between the years and the gray matter that you actually run a scenario, a, a quick vignette of the possible scenes in that movie. And I, I said, you have to forgive me, but you know, we've, we've gone there, given your name. I've already been down that road in my mind, knowing the Tarantino signature style. Right, how, well, how and he the could subject, portray it. And the subject matter. But I was expecting something totally different than the script that was plunked down in did front of me. Did you not ever, like my mind, I'm, I remember saying to you, he's known for rewriting 
writing history. You didn't think for one second. No. I thought in Glorious Bastards right away. Right. Well, the Nazis and I Hitler. Thought, as soon right. as she said Tarantino and she was skeptical, I don't know, because, you know, it's her sister's life. And I remember thinking about it for a few days and I thought, oh my God, what if? Because <gasps> he's Tarantino. And she said, what if? And I never let on. No. Never let I on. I said, what if he does like an Inglorious Bastards where the, 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 the Jews, Jews come back and kill the fucking Nazis? I was so, I mean, when I saw it, I, I was like, well, I think for me, even more so than the ending, I, I loved seeing her on screen. Yeah, she's beautiful. It freaked me. I was, I was like, What? Sharon's on, oh my God. I let it was the like surprise, he, I knew he was going to do that, did. but I let the surprises be the surprises. Oh. And that's it. You brought her to life gonna, again. I'm not going to take away anybody's cookies. No, you didn't. You definitely <laughs> didn't. You definitely did not do that. So what is next? Who is up for parole? Who is blah, well, blah, blah. Leslie's on deck again. Of course she and, is. And, um... Later, Bruce later Davis? this year, uh, no, Texas coming around. I thought we again. got him five years. Well, honey, five mm -hmm. means three, because after three years, you can put in oh, for the petition to advance. So all oh. you have to do is take a three month is the oh, the minimum course. that I know of self help course. Oh my God! And, and then this you, is the guy who and started then you a ministry. write a letter. You write a letter to the warden and petition for a, a sooner parole date this is the guy who quote found god he wrote a book he started a ministry behind bars got married had four children that all went to very good like Brigham young university Brigham you know it, it just it's uh wow so that means that if people go to no parole for mansonfamily.com they can click on his picture and sign and here we go Please again sign we need all of them your signature matters because when we dropped off all those signatures in brown's office which is now governor newsom's office it made a difference to it physically did. see that bulk of signatures from California residents that do not want these people out. It makes a difference. Yes. Not even the parole board has brought up and made a point that it's not just California. It's American citizens and even world citizens. All people that, world. that subscribe to the petition all over the world. So nobody wants these people as their neighbors not when they stop and really think about what that means mm. you know it might be a popular thing to say i'm a liberal or i have forgiveness i'm a christian i have forgiveness you need to stop and think about what it really means these are people that band together for no good reason at all started hunting human beings mm -hmm. and and making party favors out of their demise they did it for the sheer pleasure they did and that's the scariest part of and all nobody needs that as a neighbor we should not ever have to think about these people again there's a whole lot of states where people are literally put away for, for life. life yeah life means life life means life you bring up uh, something I remember interviewing The Doors, Ray Manzarek and Robbie Densmore, and I specifically asked them, when did you feel like the 60s were over for you? And it could have been Jim Morrison's death, you know, 1971, you know, it could have been. And they said, oh, the night of the Sharon Tate murders. And I remember wow. thinking, wow. And they were not alone. A lot of people independently, Henry Fonda said the same thing to me. Um, they because it was so random and so scary right. for people and so senseless. And right. I think... That's the bottom line. And also, if you were sorry for something you did, wouldn't you want to just repent in your cell? Be like, I don't ever want to see the face of light again because I'm a fucking asshole and I did do that. And if that's what my punishment is, then I'm going to take it. If I'm sorry for what I did, I'll take it. That's what I would do. I would. I'll tell you what, if it were me, honestly, if it were me and I've put myself in their shoes many a time, I'd kill myself. Mm. All right. I wouldn't want to take a taxpayer dollar if I truly all of a sudden the fog cleared. Yeah. And I could do my little introspectives like I do on myself and came up with the aha moment of, oh my God, I am batshit crazy. And I've taken multiple people's lives that I had no mm. reason, no rhyme for. That's it. I'd do myself in. Mm. I'd, I wouldn't make anybody else make that decision mm -hmm. or that call. I actually have a little bit of respect for those guys mm. that decide to go ahead and take care of their own yeah. problemed, current 
version of self, I do believe that um, that that they'll get some kind of a reward if you have clarity. If you have clarity. If you have clarity. I when don't you think... don't have clarity and you don't address the issue and there are still secrets and you know of other oh, bodies buried out there and other crimes committed and you're keeping the big secrets, you're not reformed. Also, and that's what these people are. I want to mention that heinous and senseless and brutal and barbaric as these crimes were, they made sandwiches after a night at the La Bianca's. They ate, they showered, I believe, in their yes. shower. They at their house yes. after they murdered them yes with the bodies laying yeah Ro rosemary heard her husband being stabbed and she was screaming and they put a pillowcase over her head and a cord from a lamp around her neck and they were laughing at her because she was running all over she was banging into things because she couldn't see anything but she could only hear her husband these are they're not human humans don't do that you don't feel that way when you're seeing an, you, no. humans don't do that so and like yeah. i said if by some chance i mean i i can't we're a sum total of our own experiences. I would never be in that position in the first place because I wouldn't let it go that far. I would have told those people to take a flying leap off a cliff when I was approached for that. Mm -hmm. It would be would have been very ugly right then you and there. You would have taken, if you were a Kasabian, you could dig your daughter and yeah. get out of Dodge. Yeah. Goodbye. See ya. You want to kill me on the way out? That's fine. All go ahead and are, try. These A lot of the people would still be in it if it weren't for, like they would sit at the corner of Temple yeah. and Broadway with their X's in their head, their SWAT, whatever yeah. it was, the X's yeah. card, and their ha shaved head. So those people like the Sandra Goods, the Squeaky yeah. Froms, the Ruth Ann Morehouses. Oh, and guess what? Catherine people Gillies. like Squeaky Fromm, she married another murderer. And Leslie Van Houten had a 16-year, although by pen, sexual in nature relationship with a killer that was incarcerated for a double homicide, one in Texas and the other one in Illinois. And she had a sexual pen pal relationship with him for 16 years. The only reason it stopped was because he killed himself when he lost his last appeal oh, in wow. that state. Now, that tells me something. Squeaky Fromm's hooked up with a killer, okay, uh, that has been released. These people are still attracted to the same kind of man. How reformed are you? Mm. I am sorry. Do a little self-policing in 50 years. How about that? Yeah. How about that? Does that uh, stuff come up in her parole hearings? I bring it up. I make sure it comes up. See, yeah. you are a badass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm still my daddy's little spy. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's important for people to be mindful, do their civic duty. And if you are concerned, please be concerned because I've seen how close the tipping scale is for these people to get out. And I can't tell you how many people have said to me, oh, you go to those? Like, they're never getting out. If I had a dollar for everyone who said that, I, I'd be a millionaire because yeah. that's the general thought and it's wrong to think that way. So anyway, if you and do... And it could be very unfortunately and with great sadness, I say this, it could be your brother, your sister, your mother, God your forbid, father, your child, your exactly. Child. And so if you go to noparoleformansonfamily.com, it's very simple. Uh, AJ has made it so beautifully easy. Who is AJ? You referenced him. AJ her. is my unpaid assistant. He actually started helping my mother when she was alive. He is amazing. so valuable. He's an advocate so as amazing. well. Oh, yeah. big time. Yeah. And he wow. makes it so she can go out and do the physical advocacy and get signatures. And then he'll make everything very concise. I mean, let's say it's the website so that you can go on and give a signature. Mm -hmm. And then we can print them out and... and uh, again, it takes 30 seconds. It's not like back in the day when your mom, when Doris was campaigning and you were campaigning, you can sit in your living room and do it and still have that impact, which is so important. Like that's the beauty of the, people, of the world. People don't realize it, but uh, a few years ago, we had a young man who was murdered. His name was Blaze Bernstein in Orange County by a group called Adam Waffen. Uh, this is a neo-Nazi esque kind of a group and it's becoming very prevalent here especially it, they've had problems in in the huntington beach high school area this is a big thing i was warned by the security team at corcoran prison 
years ago. That's where that, Charles Manson that was. That where Charlie was, that there was a group then. They told me that there were in excess of 80 cells across the United States. Frontline, who does a show. A great show. great show for PBS. You can see it online. It's called Hate in America. But these people, Adam Waffen, worship Charles Manson and the doctrine that he did. And we have had numerous deaths perpetrated by people outside the Manson family. But they are buying into the train of thought. There's a resurgence of that train of thought. The crazy train. Crazy train of thought. And this Blaze Bernstein was a one victim of that. There was another circumstance, I believe it was in Pennsylvania. There's been several. And you need to watch this. Look it up on the computer. Give it a look. It'll make your blood run cold. It's happening again, people. The last thing we need is one of these core... Mm-hmm. Manson family individuals to out come free, out and they look how many disciples they would have automatically yeah for you keeping the core I say the core five right is right. it five five, at five this point? I have left yeah Jeez. So the only two are dead are Manson and Adkins right so the ones that are out there still are in prison that still need to stay there is Bruce Davis Leslie Van Houten Patricia Krenwinkel uh, Tex Watson and Bobby Boussoulet. Bobby Boussoulet, that's right. Let us not forget Bobby. Bobby Boussoulet, that's <laughs> right. It's almost like there's this one comes up and then you fight that and then you got the oh, Satan, six months the in Satan between. Satan worshiper, Bobby yeah. Boussoulet. Yeah. And yeah. then and then she's like, oh, got to go back. I go, but we were just there. We just got the signature. Oh, I know, but this is for so-and-so. I'm like, holy shit, this could go on for, it goes on forever. It must have been such a nice reprieve to have something like Quentin's movie where oh, it was such a positive... positive. Love letter experience to, yeah. and love letter to your sister and to remind the world of who she was and what she did. It was. It is. It still is because it's still happening. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's got its own legs. It's yes. got its yeah. own Good. fandom. Yeah, it's brought yes. more people into mm-hmm. the Sharon Tate clubs. It makes people aware. And my whole purpose is trying to keep my whole family's dead. Mm. I know very clearly nobody's coming back, okay? There's nobody more aware of that than myself. But I'll be damned if I'm going to sit idly while it happens to someone else's. I have to die trying. And I will. I will die trying. I'm not giving it up. Oh, she won't. She's like a pit bull. I'm like she a gets on. Uh, she's I not am, letting go. I was born red. Okay, yeah. <laughs> natural red hair. Oh, I love the, in back, not to backtrack, but in the back of the book recollection, you see pictures of Deb on uh, uh, Sharon's property on Cielo, and you're wearing this great fringe dress. Is it Sharon's? It was or, Sharon's. Yes. It's so beautiful. Deb's hair is so long and red, and you must have been all of sixteen at That's the time. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so ending on a happy note, the book is, I believe, on Amazon still, is it I not? I believe it is. You can check it out. It's called Recollection. In the meantime, we really urge you to go to noparoleformansonfamily.com. Take 20 seconds, sign. You're doing the right thing, and it helps It helps with the cause. It helps Deb when she goes up to the governor's office. It helps in every way, shape, and form keep people away from your families, these horrible people. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. I love you. Love you, too.